All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to come and speak with everyone today and share a little bit about gastrointestinal disease management. So for the outline of what we'll talk about today, I have a few slides just to go through some basic nutritional considerations, and then we'll go into some specific gastrointestinal diseases, and then we have a case example that we'll go through. So when we talk about the nutritional considerations, there's a lot of nutrients that we could discuss, but to keep it at a little bit of higher level, I wanted to just briefly talk a little bit about how we can use our distribution of our macronutrients, our protein, fat, and carbohydrates for the management of gastrointestinal disease, because this plays a lot into the formulation that we may recommend and how we might want to adjust things. So for protein, if we think about the purpose of protein in the diet, it's to provide the essential amino acids to the pet. It also provides energy. So when I mentioned macronutrients, one of the characteristics is those all provide a form of energy at a different calorie per gram level. So for protein, it provides us about three and a half calories per gram. And so it's a good source of energy. It also is a source of foreign antigens. So if we think about what we are bringing into our body and what our immune system might respond to, it's the dietary protein that could stimulate an immune response if we have disruption in the gut mucosal barrier. So it sounds like you already had a lecture about adverse food reaction. So that's probably a good one to reference back to, but we'll talk about that a little bit today because that can be important in the management of some GI disease. And then the digestibility of the protein is gonna have a big impact on how it performs in terms of our gastrointestinal tolerance and um, the stool quality. So when we look at our macronutrients, protein is probably the most variable in digestibility based on the ingredients that you're feeding. So we can see anywhere from about 75% to 95% digestible um, digestibility of our protein sources. So when we're feeding a pet with GI disease, we're always trying to select our most highly digestible ingredients because those the ingredients that may be poorly digested um, or low quality proteins, what happens is because they're not digested, they make their way down to the colon where there's a lot of bacterial flora and they can be fermented by the flora and produce some mal or malodor, um, flatulence, or stool quality. So protein is important to consider in that regard. And then fat is always something that we're thinking about a lot with GI disease, because we have some GI diseases where we might need to limit fat. We also can use fat as a really nice nutrient for animals with GI disease because it's calorically dense. So while protein is about three and a half calories per gram, fat is about eight and a half calories per gram. So you don't need to feed as much of it to get the energy to the animal. And this can be really helpful for some GI diseases because we're trying to limit the volume of food that we are feeding the pet because they can have some volume intolerance and they don't wanna eat a lot. Um, and we also see that fat is very highly digestible. Unlike protein where we have a lot of variability, we typically see that most fat ingredients are over 90% digestible. But the part that comes in that makes it a little bit tricky is that the digestion of fat is complicated. It requires a functioning pancreas and liver, uh, small intestine and lymphatics. So all of our fat is absorbed through our lymphatic system, through our small intestine. So that requires um, some consideration. If you have some chronic GI diseases like lymphangiectasia, those are ones where we might want to limit that, even though it does provide these nice qualities of being energy dense and highly digestible. And just, <clears throat> just like protein, if undigested fats make it down to the lower gastrointestinal tract, they interact with bacteria and can cause fermentation 
and we'll see an osmotic diarrhea. So if we have some sort of maldigestion occurring um, related to the GI disease, that's when we may need to limit fat in the diet. Um, some other characteristics of fat is that it slows gastric emptying. So sometimes when we see pets that have delayed gastric emptying, we might want to limit the fat to help to keep the movement of the food through the GI tract. Um, but it does stimulate small intestinal peristalsis. So um, that can be good if you have an animal that needs some stimulation of their peristalsis. And then just another thing to keep in mind when you have a fat malabsorption and, or when you're deciding the best food to feed the animal is that we do require fat in our diet to absorb fat soluble vitamins. So there's been a lot of interesting studies that have come out about vitamin D status um, in animals with a variety of medical conditions, but they've shown two dogs that have um, chronic enteropathy or lymphangiectasia where they might have fat malabsorption, a lot of those dogs have low vitamin D status. And that's because of this connection with the fat. So um, I think we already covered this a little bit in the other slide. So I'll skip on to carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are a little bit different where there's no dietary requirement. So we have essential amino acids from protein, essential fatty acids that is used as a precursor for things like cholesterol and hormones, but there's really no required um, need by the animal for carbohydrates in their diet, but it provides a good source of energy. So the same as protein, about three and a half calories per gram. And we can use carbohydrates in our formula to balance the level of protein and fat that we want to target. So we often will use carbohydrates as a good form of energy to kind of help us adjust up or down the fat, the protein level. And for GI disease, we tend to try to select those more highly digestible protein or carbohydrate sources, um, rice, potato, wheat, and corn are four that you'll commonly see. Um, also in that category of carbohydrates is dietary fiber. So I say that there is no requirement for carbohydrates, but we know that fiber is very important just for our gastrointestinal health. And there's recommendations for the amount of fiber we should consume in our diets. And it's similar for pets um, that fiber is the source of a good um, precursor for bacterial fermentation. So talked a little bit about how when undigested proteins and undigested fats reach the colon, that can create some problems with bacterial fermentation. But fiber, by definition, is undigestible by our normal gastrointestinal um, enzymes. And so it's supposed to make its way down to the colon. And that's where we can see some positive fermentation and production of things like short chain fatty acids that are beneficial for the GI tract. So most of the time when we think about fibers, we break them down into these two main categories of soluble and insoluble fibers. So soluble are those fibers that can dissolve in water. And these tend to be more fermentable. Those are ones that are more easily broken down by the bacteria. Um, most soluble uh, fibers that we see in diets are things like um, come from natural ingredients like oats or guar gum. Um, I don't have it on the slide, but beet pulp is one that's in a lot of our formulas that's fermentable. Psyllium is a little bit of a unique type of fiber that it's very soluble, but it's a lower fermentability, which gives us some nice opportunity to use psyllium in some of our formulations that we'll get to later where we don't want to have too much fermentability. <laughs> so it's a balance. It's one of those examples where more is not always better. Uh, we want to have some source of soluble fiber for the microflora. But if we give too much of the soluble fiber, then we can see soft stools and diarrhea where psyllium could be used to help bring in some 
moisture or some water binding um, capability, some viscosity, but not too much fermentation. So it's a nice fiber that we will leverage in a lot of our formulations. And then insoluble fibers tend to be non-fermentable. So things like cellulose or other cereal, cereal, cereal fibers will um, provide some good qualities, but they're not as fermentable. So here's a little side-by-side -side comparison just to kind of sum up the fibers where we see insoluble fibers, they can stimulate peristalsis. So those are the insoluble fibers are that cellulose and cell, um, cereal fibers, and they can kind of create this bulk within the intestine and that gives some stimulus to the intestinal tract to push against. So it stimulates peristalsis and it can help normalize colonic transit times um, if they're going too fast or too slow. And it can bind uh, noxious agents. So that's another nice property of insoluble fibers. And then soluble fibers, they tend to slow small intestinal transit. Uh, we've talked a lot about how they're good for the GI flora. The, it's the bacteria in that fermentation process that generates short chain fatty acids and short chain fatty acids are a good energy source for colonocytes. So there's a really nice you know, envir environment there where we get that, the bacteria producing these nice nutrients to keep our guts healthy. And then this is just a little bit more information on psyllium. I already spoke to it a little bit on the other slide about why psyllium is a little bit unique because of its lower fermentability, it absorbs several times its own volume in water. And for this lecture, I can't really do a demonstration, but I've seen some really nice demonstrations where I've been in a lecture and we've mixed up some psyllium with water, set it on the table, and then a 30 minutes later, we can take out, it just forms like a jello. So if you think about that in the gastrointestinal tract of the pet, it kind of helps to absorb water. So if you have really dry, hard stools, the psyllium helps to draw in the moisture and make the stool softer. So it can work really well for animals with constipation and diarrhea, because when you have excess water, really loose stool, just like mixing that water in the cup of psyllium, it sucks it all in and helps form a gel. And when you have dry, hard stools, it draws moisture in and helps to keep it uh, a little bit softer and helps it to move through. So I really like psyllium um, for some of those properties. And then if we think about fiber being fermentable, this is also one way to think about it is as a prebiotic. So we talk a lot about uh, fibers serving as prebiotics in our diet. And some really good examples are fruto oligosaccharide, bee pulp, inulin, and others. And these are just being called prebiotics because they are the precursor to the bacteria themselves that are able to utilize these prebiotic sources for fermentation and short chain fatty acid production, like I've mentioned before. And this helps to also enhance the immune function. All right, so that was a background kind of on general nutrition. And now we'll get into some specific diseases. So the four that I'm gonna to touch upon today are acute GI disease and gastroenteral gastroenteritis, and then chronic enteropathy, which is a big category of intestinal diseases and pancreatitis, and then feline constipation. So acute gastroenteritis, these are the cases that you'll see where we have clients coming in with vomiting, diarrhea, anorexia, abdominal pain. It can really vary in severity. Um, there's also variation in the underlying etiology. And a lot of times we won't determine what the underlying cause would be. So we'll have be presented with a pet that's vomiting, has diarrhea, no specific reason that we might be able to identify, but they may have a history of 
having gotten into the trash can or maybe eating a new diet that they'd never eaten before, something that kind of disrupts their GI tract. Um, and then, of course, these cases, you always have to rule out other underlying diseases. So do blood work, make sure there's not a metabolic problem. But if you've ruled out metabolic problems, ruled out obstruction, you know, something that's obstructing their GI tract, then we tend to try to treat them nutritionally and symptomatically. So there's two approaches that have been out there, just fasting or bowel rest or feeding through the disease. So I wanted to talk to about that a little bit. Um, often we've heard the recommendation to withhold food for 24 to 48 hours to give the intestines time to rest, if you will, um, and let kind of those peristaltic contractions subside. You know, if they're not able to keep down food, that's also another thought behind it, just give the bowel rest. But as We've done some research. There's been studies that have shown that when you fast, you also increase intestinal permeability. So within the GI tract, we start to see some leaking into the bloodstream. Um, and one of the thoughts behind that is that we actually need to deliver some nutrients to the intestinal tract to help prevent that loss of permeability. And also we see decrease in digestive enzymes. So in shutting down the food, you actually kind of shut down the GI tract. And so there's a balance of trying to continue to give some nutrition and, and prevent some of those negative side effects. So more often we're seeing this recommendation to feed through the GI disease to help improve the health of the enterocytes and also um, as a prokinetic, it can help decrease vomiting and actually increase the speed of recovery. So one nice study, I guess this is not a new study any longer, um, but it, this study came out probably when I was doing my residency and it was a little bit controversial at the time um, where there were puppies with parvovirus and historically you just did not feed them as they had a severe GI disease, but they showed in the study that those puppies that they continued to give some nutrition had shorter hospital stays, it improved their intestinal permeability and improved their outcome. So that kind of made a shift away from this idea of resting towards feeding through the GI disease. For helping these animals through, you do want to feed small frequent meals because they're still having trouble, um, obviously, with digestion. So the idea is to continue to give them some small amount of nutrition that they are able to tolerate. So usually we'll begin with about 25 to 33% of their resting energy requirement, especially if they're vomiting. And that can be broken up over several meals during the day. If they're hospitalized, you may be able to do that even through a continuous rate infusion. If you have a, a nasoesophageal tube in and you can hook it up to a pump, you could do it just very slow and continuously. Um, but often they will often do well, even if you can just break it up into um, multiple feedings over the day, every three to four hours, depending on you know, what's feasible for the clinic and the patient. And for these diets, we're really looking for something that's going to be the most digestible, um, low in fiber, because fiber adds some bulk and the colon has to kind of deal with the fiber. And when they're in this more acute gastric disruption phase, we want to keep that as low as possible and give a moderate amount of protein. And so the therapeutic diet can be dispensed. So if you have, I mentioned you know, the range of severity and I was mentioning <laughs> of parvo dogs in mind where we would have them in the hospital, of course, and might be feeding them. But for our more um, less severe cases of acute diarrhea, you may want to dispense them with a therapeutic diet to go home, 
and feed that up to two or three weeks until their GI tract um, starts to settle down. So I'd mentioned that a lot of these diets for acute diarrhea tend to be higher in fat to increase palatability. We often see that when they're not feeling well, they don't feel like eating as much. Also the high digestibility of protein is something that's a nice characteristic and the smaller meals. But for those fat sensitive diseases that I've mentioned like pancreatitis, PLE is protein losing enteropathy, which is often um, seen with lymphangiectasia for a patient that might present with hyperlipidemia. Um, those would be ones, of course, where we would limit fat. So fat can be very variable based on the patient. So for cats, it's very similar, highly digestible, low fiber diet. Cats tend to tolerate fat better than dogs. So I think the right level of fat in the diet for a cat, we've seen that kind of over the years, we've been less concerned about feeding higher fat diets to cats, even when they have chronic pancreatitis or acute GI disease, where dogs tend to be more responsive to a low fat diet. There's been one study in cats that had chronic diarrhea and they fed a high fat versus a low fat diet and they had the same response. So that started to move the thought away from really needing to restrict fat in cats like we do in dogs. So the next thing I was gonna talk about was chronic enteropathy. So we have these acute cases that, are, that we see quite frequently. Um, we're often using diet as one of the main things for the management of those acute cases. And then we have these chronic cases where we have a pet that may have had chronic diarrhea or vomiting for usually the definition is at least three weeks, three or four weeks that's been inter, either intermittent or continuous. And for these cases, again, we wanna rule out other potential causes like endoparasites, metabolic disease, neoplasia, but once you've ruled out those other underlying causes, they fall into this group of disease called chronic enteropathy. So there's been a lot of terminology out there for chronic enteropathy. So I wanted to kind of bring that up front and so that we all can understand what we're talking about with chronic enteropathy. If we think of it as the umbrella term, and um, within that we have food responsive enteropathy. So that's really a definition that you put on the disease once you've tried a um, elimination diet trial and you've responded, then those are food responsive enteropathy. Some cases will be tried on antibiotics and respond. So they're put in this category of antibiotic responsive enteropathy. And then there's the immunosuppressive or steroid responsive uh, enteropathies. So these are those cases that need steroids or need some sort of immunosuppressant to really get their disease managed. Um, so a lot of these cases actually, you may try diet and you'll get a little bit of a response or antibiotics might help a little bit, but they tend to be the cases that then actually require some sort of immunosuppressive. And those get classified also the other term that's been the, probably the most common term that you may have heard is inflammatory bowel disease. So IBD. So that really includes these immunoresponsive, steroid responsive, or even non-responsive enteropathy. So hopefully we don't have too many cases that fall in this non-responsive enteropathy, but those would just be those just really challenging cases where diet, steroids, antibiotics, um, everything that we've tried doesn't really bring their disease to full remission. And then protein losing enteropathy is, could be in the, any of these actually, but it's more defined by the, the presence of a hypoproteinemia. So a low albumin, maybe low uh, globulins as well. And these cases tend to sometimes have lymphangiectasia um, associated with their disease. And they tend to be some of the most 
clinically the most severe cases and sometimes the most difficult to manage. But we've also had a lot of studies recently that have shown that dogs with protein losing enteropathy can respond to diet alone. So you could have a protein losing food responsive enteropathy. So it kind of sits in a little bit of a separate category. So as far as the pathogenesis of chronic enteropathy, it's really multiple components. It's by definition an idiopathic disease. So we actually don't really know fully what causes chronic enteropathy in pets. So we kind of define them by what they respond to. So we know that there's some interaction of the diet and the environment, also genetics and inflammation. And then dysbiosis is one that we've been really interested in in recent years of how the microflora gets disrupted when they have chronic enteropathy. And that's probably secondary to the disease, but it, it all seems kind of related. And that's what we're still trying to figure out through different research studies. So for food responsive chronic enteropathy, the gold standard is really a elimination diet trial followed by a subsequent rechallenge. So that second step is sometimes skipped over. <laughs> if you have, have a case that has had chronic enteropathy for a while and you feed an elimination diet trial and all of their signs go away, um, it's not wrong to just keep them on that elimination diet to control their symptoms, but you might have some cases where you want to go ahead and then re-challenge them either with individual ingredients or another diet to see if they'll tolerate it. And that can give you some more information on, you know, are they having adverse food reactions to all foods? Um, are there certain ingredients that they can tolerate? And that gives you the complete picture. I do see just for practicality and just by the owner's own wishes. If they find a diet that controls the diarrhea and the vomiting, they want to, they want to stay on that. <laughs> so you'll probably experience that as well. Um, so when you do an elimination diet trial, it's probably similar to um, what was described with the adverse food reaction lecture. You want to keep the diet as strict as possible, um, eliminating any treats or supplements or anything that have flavors that could bring in uh, antigen, a uh, dietary protein that would disrupt the diet elimination. So keeping them strict to the diet and then look for gastrointestinal and also dermatologic signs are sometimes seen in these cases um, because they may have not only GI related intolerance, but they might also have a dermatopathy where we see itching and scratching so for an elimination diet trial, we tend to utilize hydrolyzed proteins. Uh, Royal Canin has different options with anallergenic being one that we really recommend for elimination diet trials, being our most highly hydrolyzed protein source. Uh, we also have um, some different options with soy hydrolysates and our hypoallergenic diets. Um, that also do very well in dogs with chronic enteropathy. We have a nice study that was done in dogs with chronic enteropathy on our hypoallergenic diet with a really good response. And then unique protein sources can be used as well, you know, depending on the region around the world. In the US, we have a few more uh, diets that are based on unique protein sources like venison and rabbit. Sometimes those can be utilized with good success as well. Um, but the idea is just to limit the ingredients to limit the antigens that present a potential antigen to the GI tract. And on top of that, we are also picking ingredients that are highly digestible and well absorbed. And then feeding these strictly for one to two weeks is the response time that you would expect to see some significant improvement for GI signs. If you have a patient that also has dermatologic signs, we see that that can take a little bit longer for those to start to resolve. So when you're doing an elimination diet trial, you might come across recommendations that vary in length. Um, I always like to give it 
you know, for GI signs, you might want to see some response within one week, like a pretty significant response within two to three weeks. But again, for those germ signs, it's always important to take it out a little bit longer because we sometimes see that uh, owners or veterinarians will give up on the trial if they don't see it right away. But we know that we can also see resolution if we just feed it a little bit longer for those dermatologic signs. And then for dogs and cats with chronic enteropathy, one thing that I wanted to remember to mention is that we see a lot of these patients have low cobalamin levels. And so when you're doing diagnostic workups to rule out other metabolic problems, it's always important to look at their cobalamin status. There's been quite a few studies now that have looked and demonstrated that when you supplement in, uh, with cobalamin or B12, when their animals have a low status, we see improvement in their GI signs just by reintroducing B12. So sometimes these cases, if you don't check in your um, giving them an elimination diet trial or even antibiotics and steroids and they're not responding, it could be because they have a low cobalamin status. So there's also been studies in recent years that have shown oral, um, giving it as a supplement, oral supplement is just as effective as giving it um, as a parental form. So a lot of times we will give injectable B12 for these cases, but if that's not available um, or if it's not convenient, there's some nice studies to show that it still is effective orally. And then I've already mentioned protein, interop protein losing enteropathy a little bit, but these again tend to be some of our most severe cases of chronic enteropathy or inflammatory bowel disease. And we can also see protein losing enteropathy with cases of lymphoma. And we see a lot of the signs that just represent chronic enteropathy in general, but maybe more severely, we tend to see more severe weight loss, more severe vomiting and anorexia. And the diagnosis of protein losing enteropathy is confirmed by intestinal biopsies. So for, too fast. Um, so for the management of PLE, we want to feed something that's high in energy density, small mills. These are the cases that tend to often have lymphangiectasia associated with them. So we tend to see better response to low fat diets. Um, I say that, and I will also say that we've seen some variation. We've seen some individual pets that still tolerate a little bit more fat. But in general, these are cases that will start with a low fat diet. Um, we tend to see the best response. Also, again, picking a diet that's gonna be highly digestible with lower levels of fiber um, to help with improved digestibility. So for additional diet considerations with protein losing enteropathy, since this falls within this category of chronic enteropathy, we tend to see good response in novel protein or hydrolyzed diets. So one of the challenges can be that there's not that many hydrolyzed diets or novel protein diets that are low in fat. So these can be some of the cases where we might recommend a home cooked diet if we can't find a diet that is low enough in fat to manage the disease in these cases. And the pros and cons of home cooked diets, the pro is that you can really control the ingredients, thick low fat ingredients, um, also allows to treat animals with multiple problems. So if there's any other concurrent, concurrent morbidity that's associated, you can have a lot of control over the distribution of nutrients with a home cooked diet. But the cons are that you have to make sure that you work with a veterinary nutritionist to make sure it's nutritionally adequate. When we have home cooked diets that we recommend to pet owners, we often see what we call recipe drift. So you provide a nice recommendation, but maybe that ingredient isn't available in the kitchen that day. So they switch it out. And over time, the recipe kind of drifts. Um, so 
we have more control over the recommendation, but maybe less control of what's actually fed to the pet because um, you can have things kind of drift over time and it can be time consuming and expensive for owners. Okay, so now shifting gears a little bit to acute pancreatitis. Um, pancreatitis is you know, one that might present just like those acute cases of gastroenteritis. Um, so you'll have a patient come in with just a history of acute vomiting or diarrhea. It might be similar to what I mentioned earlier where maybe they got into some foods that they weren't supposed to or the garbage. Um, but the difference is when you do your diagnostic workup, you can um, see that they have elevated pancreatic enzymes. If you're able to do an ultrasound, you might see an inflamed pancreas. Um, so these can be some of the diagnostics that we can use to help us more um, specifically diagnose pancreatitis. And we also have canine and feline um, PLI tests, the pancreatic um, lipase immunoreactivity tests. So once you have a diagnosis of pancreatitis, the treatment is going to be supportive because a lot of these patients might be severely dehydrated. They may need to be hospitalized for a short period. And fat restriction is going to be one of the nutritional approaches that's going to be important as fat is a very strong stimulus for the pancreas. For the pancreas. So we want to try to limit that stimulus on the pancreas while it's inflamed. And then again, a highly digestible diet. Um, one thing to keep in mind is when you're looking for a low fat diet, you may think of a weight loss diet, but they tend not to be great options because they're usually pretty high in insoluble fibers. They have a low energy density, so they're not the best for some of these critical care cases. Often with acute pancreatitis, you may need to do assisted feeding if the pet is anorexic and won't eat on their own. Um, it sounds like you also had a critical care lecture recently by Dr. Lennox, so and that would have gone into a lot more detail, but just briefly, we have different types of assisted feeding. A nas nasoesophageal feeding tube is probably going to be the easiest in some of these severe critical cases because it doesn't require anesthesia. Um, you can place it pretty easily with the animal awake. Um, a esophageal tube or a percutaneous gastrostomy tube or a PEG tube are going to give you a little bit more options for maybe sending the animal home if you needed to do more long-term feeding. It also opens up the types of diets that you can feed. You can feed a more blenderized uh, food, a wet food, a canned food that you've blended because the tubes tend to be high, larger in diameter. Nasoesophageal feeding tubes tend to limit you to a liquid diet. Um, Jejunostomy tubes are probably not used very frequently anymore. They require surgical placement. They were popular or at least in theory because you bypass the pancreas when you place the tube into the jejunum. So in the duodenum is where you get that stimulus of the pancreas and the pancreatic enzymes are entering the GI tract through the duodenum. So if you bypass it and place the tube in the jejunum, that can help reduce the stimulus of the pancreas as well. But it's a very complicated place. And we found that a lot of times, just like with those acute cases, you can continue to feed through the disease just by feeding small volumes over multiple meals per day, and they tend to do well. But parental nutrition would be nutrition that you give intravenously um, is also another option, probably mainly used more in university or specialty hospitals, but that could be for some severe cases that just really aren't tolerating any oral food. So for the intral nutrition I mentioned, if you're using an any tube, liquid diets are gonna be the main one that we are going to look to. Many of the critical care diets designed for tube feeding are high in fat. Royal Canin's ICU liquid GI low fat is one option. So when we came out with that product, I think a lot of nutritionists were very happy because it's hard to find a low fat liquid diet. Um, you can also 
use blenderized canned diets, like I mentioned, if you have a larger tube um, through an e-tube or a gastric tube. And then for home care, sending them home with a highly digestible, low fat diet for one to two weeks is recommended. And then longer, depending on the severity or chronicity, sometimes we see these acute cases resolve and they, they go on to kind of go back to their normal status, or we can have cases that tend to have lingering chronic pancreatitis and really need to be maintained on a lower fat diet for a long time or lifelong. But you can start to gradually transition them onto either kind of a moderate fat diet or their regular diet over one to two weeks um, just to see how they tolerate it. So the one thing tricky about pancreatitis is that there's so much variation between patients. You know, you'll have those, like I said, that can go back to their normal diet and those that are going to need it for a long time. So really patient by patient, just slowly transitioning and monitoring is the key for pancreatitis. For chronic pancreatitis, <laughs> as I mentioned, um, these are going to be the ones where we start to see transitioning and maybe they might start to have some nauseousness or vomiting start to come back. So these would be ones where we do want to use a low or moderate fat diet for a longer period of time. These also tend to be patients who might see hyperlipidemia. So I think that the poster breed is a miniature schnauzer that tends to have hyperlipidemia and they tend to be prone to pancreatitis. So if you have a case like that, that's probably going to clue you in that this is one that you're going to need to manage more long-term versus a kind of an acute and they'll kind of return to normal. And another important thing to always keep in mind when you're sending home owners with diet recommendations is to bring up human foods, snacks, treats, uh, because those can be just part of the normal day of a pet owner and their pet's interaction. And sometimes we forget about that. So just giving a good treat recommendation, reminding owners to avoid those high fat ingredients are important. In cats, it's very similar to what I mentioned before, where we see that cats tend to tolerate fat a little bit better. Um, we do tend to avoid diets that are very high in fat or even excessively high protein diets. We have a lot more diets on the market for cats that are very high in protein. And I mentioned fat being one of the main stimuluses of the pancreas, but protein also stimulates the pancreas. So, um, that this is where we can take advantage of our carbohydrates in the diet to balance the protein and fat level. And just like dogs, if they're anorexic or hyporexic, getting nutrition in them with the feeding tube is important early on in the management when you're seeing these as critical care cases. And then there's a, a mention here about hydrolyzed or novel protein diets. If it's concurrent with IBD, you may have heard the term triditis that's sometimes seen in cats. So this, these are cases where we'll see cats that have this kind of chronic enteropathy or inflammatory bowel disease, but also have pancreatic inflammation and then can even have some inflammation within the liver, some cholangiohepatitis. So we see this you know, triditis, if you will. So if you have a cat that you're trying to manage with both, this is one where you might lean more towards a hydrolyzed or novel protein diet than just a typical GI diet that's more moderate in fat. Okay, so for the last topic, um, try to hopefully get through this because I might be running close on time now, is the constipation in cats. And this is... Um, a condition in cats that we see where we want to pick a highly digestible diet um, and then utilize fiber to bring in some of those properties that we really talked about at the beginning, where we have some soluble fibers to increase fecal moisture, a little bit of insoluble fiber does help to provide some stimulation, but in these cases, omega colon, we try to reduce the amount of insoluble fiber so that they don't have a like a lot of bulking um, since they already have the distended colon. So we had done a study, this has been a while now, um, 
for our diet that we call fiber response in cats. And this was one looking at a psyllium enriched diet. So I had mentioned previously that we really like psyllium because you can use more of it in the diet and bring in some of those properties where it can absorb water into the stool and help with those hard dry stools without providing too much of a precursor for those bacteria in the intestine that will cause a lot of fermentation. So it's, it's really nice fiber to utilize for this property where it brings in fecal moisture and viscosity without kind of overloading the bacteria with a fermentable source. And this study had a really great response in 66 cats across France and Canada, where they had improved clinical signs, fecal scores, and they were able to significantly reduce the amount of lactulose or cisapride that was required to manage their constipation. So um, now I wanna do a, a case example. So this is the most fun part of the lecture, I think. So I'll get into that. And this is a case that was a 12 week old Rottweiler that came in with the presenting complaints of vomiting, hematochesia, bloody diarrhea, lethargy, and anorexia. And the history of this Wattweiler Teddy was that he was adopted just a week prior from a friend, but the friend didn't provide any vaccination history. Teddy was just on a dry puppy food, but had stopped eating three days prior. So they were offering different foods, no appetite, not even drinking any water. The physical exam um, showed that Teddy was lethargic. The temperature was 36 Celsius, but he had pale, tacky mucous membranes, uh, delayed capillary refill time, weak femoral pulses, and then on abdominal palpation, you could feel these thick intestines with fluid inside, and Teddy's stomach was also painful on palpation. So rectal exam did show some loose bloody stool. So here's a quick time for some questions. You can put answers in the chat or just kind of give it some thought yourself. Um, what rule outs might you have? And what are some of the first diagnostic tests you want to do to address some of those rule outs? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Since this isn't a polling question, uh, don't worry if you just wanna think about it on your own, I'll throw in a few answers. But I think we already hinted maybe at the beginning that one of our top rollouts is parvovirus. Um, also, there's other things to consider, canine distemper, giardia, uh, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, um, or another toxin. So if we are having these as our top priorities, one of the main diagnostics we're gonna wanna do is a parvo test. <laughs> so they did an in-house ELISA parvo test on Teddy and it was positive. So the diagnosis was pretty quick, um, but also for other diagnostics, they did a complete blood count. And so this is what you might see on the CBC hemo concentration. So we could tell from the CBC that Teddy was dehydrated. That was also pretty uh, evident on the physical exam, but anemic, low levels of all of the white blood cells and also a thrombocytopenia. On the serum chemistry, Teddy also had hypoproteinemia, a low blood glucose, um, low electrolytes, sodium, potassium, chloride were all low. There was also a pre-renal azotemia, also again, just demonstrating that Teddy was very dehydrated, a hyperbilirubinemia, high alkaline phosphatase, and a hypocholesterolemia. So Teddy was very sick. Um, other recommended diagnostics, that could be done um, for Teddy could have been an abdominal ultrasound or some sort of abdominal imaging 
radiographs or ultrasound to rule out in the susception um, or other gastrointestinal foreign bodies. Um, also a fecal float to rule out hookworms or other endoparasites is an, a good option. So we've been talking a lot about nutritional treatment. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to pause for a minute before we jumped into what was done for Teddy in this case and see, give you all a chance to think about what medical treatments you might want to start for Teddy and what nutritional treatments you want to include. So I don't know if I gave you enough time. <laughs> we'll give it a second. Uh, so we'll go on to the medical treatments just for the sake of time. Um, for the medical treatments, I had said over and over, well, it looks like we have very strong confirmation that Teddy is dehydrated. So of course, IV fluid therapy is so important for these cases of parvovirus. Um, Teddy also got a glucose bolus because of the hypoglycemia that they saw on the serum chemistry. IV antibiotics were started, also IV antiemetics to help with the vomiting. Um, and I've listed here um, four different antiemetics that could be recommended. Also analgesics, analgesics to help manage the GI pain. Um, we do avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatories because those um, are not well tolerated when they're dehydrated and they can also have secondary GI problems. So butophanine is a good option for a GI analgesia in parvo cases. And then prophylactically deworm, because we know from the diagnostic that Teddy has parvovirus, but with the history of not being vaccinated, probably hadn't been dewormed. So even though it might not be the primary problem, it can be a secondary problem. It's uh, just prophylactically something easy you can do to help rule, rule out that being a contributing problem. So nutritional support, you heard in the history that Teddy had already been anorexic for three days and they had been trying to feed Teddy and he wasn't um, interested in any food. So this is a case where we wanted to start nutritional therapy right away um, by placing in a nasogastric tube. Again, the big pro with any tubes is they don't require anesthesia. They're relatively inexpensive. The smaller diameter does limit you to liquid, form, liquid formulas. Um, but in this case, the Royal Canaan ICU recovery liquid was selected. The recovery is a nice one because it is high in energy and it allows to give less volume. And um, we've mentioned earlier that when you start up these cases with control feeding, you usually want to start by slowly introducing them to the nutrition, um, especially if they're vomiting and see how they tolerate it. So in Teddy's cases, we started with one third of the resting energy requirement on day one, and then increased it by an additional third over the next two days, and then split that amount over for the six meals per day. So Teddy's condition continued to improve over the first four days of hospitalization. On day five, Royal Canaan gastrointestinal puppy was offered orally, and that was recommended to do a slow transition over five days five to six. And then by day six of hospitalization, Teddy was 100% on the oral diet of gastrointestinal puppy and was discharged with that diet to be continued at home for the next two weeks, was slowly transitioning to the regular diet after that. 